Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms where I give you a heads up about upcoming shows and which date and time they will be aired. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the shows, MP3 files which you can download, or links to your favorite platform like iTunes, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and all other major sources. You can find information for upcoming and past talk show appearances as well as new book projects at MarlenePardo.com. You can also purchase books and merchandise there. And you can visit my author page on Amazon at Marlene Pardo Pelliser. Due to popular demand, I'm narrating my true believer stories that have collected throughout the years in a new series called Supernatural Storytime. You can find links at SupernaturalStoryTime.com. If you are into classic horror, ghosts, and adventure stories, I narrate some of those at Nightshade Diary. And you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If you would like to read noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, you can visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. I do want to thank you all for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. How's everybody doing today? Good, I hope. I've been super busy. As a matter of fact, I was just speaking uh, with tonight's guest, which you are all going to be very excited to hear who that is in just a minute, uh, that I just finished wrapping up a book, which is uh, due to be released on Amazon on October 17th. It's my first fiction book. It's going to be, uh, as a matter of fact, it's going to be a chronicle. So it's book one, and they were, and I'm supposed to do like a spinoff of it by the end of November. It's like very busy. But anyway, guys, and I know... You might not uh, hear or see this for a little bit. I mean, here it's, we're into October, my favorite month, because of course it's my birthday, but also because it's Halloween, it's that time of the year where it's legit to be weird, like I usually am all year long. You know, you don't get the weird looks. So, but anyway, let's get to the good part. Uh, today's guest is Dave Spinks. And I've had him on here before, and I'm sure any, anybody out there involved in paranormal world in one way or other has heard about Dave. Uh, he's been in this field for so, so long. And like I said, the last time I spoke to him what was about a year ago, so he's going to bring us up to speed on everything that's going on. And uh, believe me, he's a busy guy. So how are you doing today, Dave? Hey, good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. No, I'm contrary it's my pleasure um and like i said no bio needed for you because you are so well known in the paranormal field and uh we were talking about that you're working on books and a whole bunch of stuff and we spoke about a year ago and um if you want like i said i think when we last spoke you had you you didn't have the the book you mentioned the one about virginia um if you want to talk about that let's get started with that and uh what is that? Is that firsthand experiences or investigations you've done, or are these just stories that you've heard of? Well, it's um, it's called the Real West Virginia Hauntings, and it's mm-hmm. a series that I'm doing. Okay. Um, I released uh, Volume One with um, Eerie Lights Publishing back in May of this year. Okay. And basically, what it is is um, it's encompassing like all of my investigations over many many years here in the mountain state my home state of west virginia okay. and the first two the first two volumes um are in alphabetical order all 55 counties of the state i've done at least one investigation in all 55 counties wow and the the first two volumes will encompass uh many of those in alphabetical order and then the third fourth and fifth volumes will just be a hodgepodge all mixed up of all different investigations i've done because obviously um i've done uh inve- some investigations way more than one in some counties sure. you know? mm-hmm. that's just how it worked out but um it's it, you know it's 20 plus years of investigating in the mountain state so um right. you know in the book it uh, chronicles some of the the count and i go county by county in alphabetical so um it chronicles some of the local folklore on some of the ghost tales 
Uh, and then it uh, also tells a little tiny bit of history about each county. And then it chronicles uh, my investigation and my results and what I experienced during all those investigations. Great. Yeah, that personal experience. And like you said, maybe I take it sometimes you're able to go back more than once and do but sometimes people don't realize that in investigations sometimes oh, yeah. you get to the bottom of it and sometimes you don't depending if yeah. you have access or not yeah some of the actual cases that are in the in the volumes are ongoing cases that i'm still working on oh. like i you know it'll be it'll tell you in the book oh, this is still an ongoing investigation um look for further uh you know information in later volumes so um mm -hmm. uh, and of course, some, you know, like I said, some counties, I have multiple locations, you know, in per county. So I've got so much, you know, so many cases in, in, the, in here in my home state that I, I literally have enough to do five, six volumes easy. So right. Right. I'm, I'm very proud of this series because, um, you know, it showcases me as being, a, you know, probably the most prolific investigator in West Virginia. Um, because I've done so many cases here over so many years, you yeah. know, and, uh, in volume one, the cover has the Greenbrier ghost on it, which. Right. Is that is such a good story. Yes. Yeah. And I'm the only person to ever be allowed in the house that she was murdered in to investigate. Mm -hmm. I didn't so, know that house was still standing. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a private residence and it's owned. Um, you know, and, uh. I got the rare opportunity and the only opportunity uh, as being a professional investigator uh, to investigate that murder house. So that's a, you know, kind of a, a real special honor for me. And that's why I put the Greenbrier Ghost on the front of the first cover. Yeah, people don't understand that when that occurred, which was based on a true documented murder, because that's how it started out. You know, it's yeah. not like an urban myth. It's an actual murder that took place. Yeah. And that it's one of those, uh, you know, things that you see in the movie, but it actually happened where her ghost supposedly led to the identification of who killed her. Yeah. Yep. It's the only time in recorded history that a man was convicted and sentenced to life in prison based pretty much basically off of a ghost testimony. So um, because her ghost came to her mom in the dream three different times telling her that her husband killed her and the mom was so shaken and, and upset by it that she went to the local sheriff and every and got them to dig her body up and sure enough yes. you know she had marks around her neck her her um her larynx was uh smashed in and her neck was actually broken as well um and during the during the funeral and all that he wouldn't let anyone near her. he was acting very suspicious and put her in a very high neck dress and in those days um like the women would be the one to clean the body and stuff, but he was right. anybody yes. near, and he was throwing like really hellacious fits and everything about any, when anyone came near. So you know, it was pretty obvious that he was trying to cover something up as well. And he was convicted and sent to Moundsville Penitentiary, which is another notorious. Yes, I've hot been there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that place is. Woo -hoo. Which is kind of weird because it's a lot of synchronicity for me, because I've done you know. Not only have I trained as a law enforcement officer in that prison many, many times, mm -hmm. I also have uh, investigated as a paranormal investigator as well. So I kind of have a little bit of a unique perspective. There's only a handful of people that can say that, and you can count them on one hand. So, you know, um, it's... But he was, you know, he, that, that, the guy that killed her, well, that later on, her mom was, she did not like him to begin with, right? Her... Uh, the, in other words, the mother-in-law right. was not too keen on him. It's almost like she kind of, yeah. yeah, she, he had a bad vibe about him and come mm -hmm. to find out he had been married several other times and all his other wives came up mysteriously dead too. So yeah. people didn't realize serial... back then you could just move away a little bit. That was it and start fresh and just hope nobody like remembered who you were or anything like that. Yeah. And he ended up dying in, up there a short time later in the prison where he's buried on the property in a unmarked grave. He's just got a numb. Right. I think it was uh, some uh, either epidemic or something that went through the prison, right? That he caught it and he just like. Yeah. But I thought when um, people don't realize that, I mean, of course, coming from her mother, but people don't realize that for 
the lawn what was it that he said that had happened to her originally that she fell down the stairs or what was it the uh, excuse that he gave that why she yeah, died yeah they tried to say it was like fainting illness that you know they didn't have oh. a lot of good medical back in those days so right they theorized that the way he set it up to make it look like she fell down the stairs but he he was at work and then he sent a young boy on an errand to the house mm -hmm. to use him as a patsy to find her body right. and they found her at the bottom of the stairs but um you know, there was a lot of suspicious the way it looked and everything. Of course, he ran and got help, and and you know that gave her his name was Trout, the the, the killer's name, her husband. Mm -hmm. And um, he uh, you know, he gave himself an alibi saying, "Well, I was at work. I don't, you know, I was here. I'm innocent, whatever." Right. And he got for a short time, but then when they dug her up and re-examined her, yeah, it was clear that she had been killed. So, let me ask you: This is an in that investigation, is he there also haunting or? Um, what I got in, in that house is more, it's more residual, I think, than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I got, I did get a, a, a growly man's voice saying his name was Trout. And I also had a female voice when I was doing EVP sessions and ghost box sessions. I, you know, I asked who's, uh, who killed you? And it said clear as a bell, Trout. And it's actually on my. You can go to my YouTube page and check out the Greenbrier Ghost Investigation, mm -hmm. and and you can see those results on there. Wow! So it's some pretty compelling stuff. Yeah, people don't realize that they've actually got like a marker, historical marker, set up oh, yeah. because of this. This is really, I mean, people, you know, but sometimes you hear these stories, especially that happened so long ago, and it it kind of like warps out and it becomes urban myth, but. People don't understand this was all based on fact and in you know and of course when it went to the courts they took notes of everything of of the entire case and then they actually have uh, raised a marker showing where all of this took place uh and chances are that even if even with suspicion unless it was for her mom having those dreams he would have gotten away with it Hello? Yes. <laughs> Cut out for a second. It's there. okay. It's all right. Um, now, let me ask you, uh, when you went to as well, Mac Moundsville, I, unfortunately, I was just passing through. I didn't have a chance to, but you could tell that place is like that. That's the one that's got that, um, what is it, the sugar shack? Is that the that uh, area yeah. down there that they said the yeah. guards wouldn't even go down there? No, it was uh, very, that's where most of the debauchery and... Uh, uh all kinds of bad stuff happened there you know right. in that area it was too dangerous for officers to even go in there mm -hmm. even though they did on occasion but uh it wasn't too smart you know um i've done numerous investigations up at that up at that penitentiary and got some of the most compelling stuff and i've it. seen a camera fly across the room and smash uh numerous evps cell door slamming you know went up in the higher up tiers that are closed off to the public and mm -hmm. all kinds of crazy stuff yeah, and you saw when I was there, they, you know, of course, they, they did, you know, they only take you to certain areas, but you could tell that some of these prisoners, not surprisingly, they were like into Satanism or devil worship. I mean, they, you know, you know, they would put all these things on the walls, scratch it, paint it. Um, oh, yeah. Well, see, a lot of people don't know the history of Moundsville. The reason it's called Moundsville, or the, and it's actually, they, the locals call it the city of the dead, because literally, literally when the white settlers came in, they pretty much built the city of Moundsville right on top of ancient mound builders. Uh, it was a whole city of Native American ruins and uh, that was built by the ancient mound builders. And they pretty much leveled it, you know, desecrated all the graves um, and everything else and built the, the town that is known as Moundsville right on top of it. I so know. That, um, is, were, that is so people, interesting. People don't realize sometimes yeah, what the yeah. land is about. And right across the street from the prison is the largest mound on the East Coast. And uh, there's two of them. There's one beside the prison and one right in front of it. And they, you know, they have a museum there and everything. And the prison mm -hmm. sets directly on ancient ruins. And when they were building that prison, you know, it's built with hand cut stone and yes. inmates would die. And they would, they buried, basically just buried them in the walls too, as well. So, you know, oh, they you did? have all these. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, not to mention all the numerous uh, just gr grisly deaths that have occurred on inmate on inmate. And they had the huge riots there in the 80s. And, um, you know, 
what's what a what a crazy interesting fact about that prison is up in the warden's area mm-hmm. they uncovered uh uh, actual giant upside down pentagram that was built into a structure. Are you into- serious? Yeah. So whoever built that had some malintentions involved because what other state building have you ever heard of that had a, an upside down pentagram in it? And it was Maybe hidden that's... behind the wall for many, 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 many years. Let me ask and you this. That's were... all, that dates back originally what to like the Civil War, right? Or post Civil yeah, War? Yeah. Yeah. Before, like they were building that right before the Civil War. So, um, you know, it was all hand cut, all built by inmates, you know, and um, uh, somehow someone got they built a, a upside down pentagram. It's big. It's huge. And it's built into the structure itself. And you said it was what behind a wall, what in the warden's office? Up in the up in the, up in the warden's area. Where well, they uh, live, because the, people don't realize back then the warden's family and everybody would live on the premises. Yeah. yeah. So. At some point that's during its so construction, creepy. you know, yeah, I mean, and it was uncovered during renovations, and that's very, very, I've never heard of anything like that in a state-owned building, you know, built by the state uh, and whatnot, you know. and Yeah, because you think, who who's going to be able to build something like this without uh, an approval, in other words, from the powers that be? <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, uh I've interviewed, I've, you know, I've inter- interviewed many o- officers and an interesting fact about me is I actually worked in the DOC and I supervised for two years before I was a federal officer. I supervised many of the inmates that were in the old Moundsville pen when they got moved to the new pen. Mm-hmm. And when, you know, talking to them over the years and some of them are out of prison now, I interviewed several inmates that were spent a lot of time in, in the Moundsville pen. And they said, man, we would see, you know, we everybody would always talk about it because they would see ghosts, you know, apparitions walking through the halls and on the tiers at night. People would get messed with at night by unseen things. You would hear Native American chanting, all kinds of just bizarre stuff. And there was, a, you know, a lot of the inmates were into Satanism and devil worship that were in the pen. So, you know, a lot of bad, bad stuff happened there. You know, a lot of bu- a lot of blood and that bad energy from killings and stuff is, you know, forever entrapped in that facility and on the ground so but yeah you know, but, but but that thing is like one thing is for prisoners to do stuff on the walls of their cells but another right. thing is to actually yeah. build something into the wall right. right that's just totally bizarre you know that and is it, disturbing i'll tell you that much right now yeah yeah you can look it up you know and, and see the pictures of it but it was revealed for the first time i think during some renovations of that area um when uh, the paranormal state went there um Mm -hmm. and a good friend steve hummel worked there for many years he owns the archive of the afterlife museum that's right down the street from there and he he, um he's got some artifacts from the pen and stuff that he's purchased over the years that people had sold on ebay he's actually got one of the executioners caps from the electric chair there in his museum that you know was on eight inmates heads as they got fried and that that artifact is very very active i bet as and they can. also have a gallows there also as far as the drop i saw in one of the buildings yeah they call it the wagon gate mm-hmm. and that was the original gate first build it and that's where they used to hang people at yeah yeah i saw that and i was like man this place i mean i, I couldn't stay there long but it was like ah i mean this is like this is gonna be like take your pick as far as active intelligent hauntings and probably malevolent yep. ones too yeah that place you yeah, can tell yeah Next volume, volume two of my book, it will be out uh, sometime next year. Um, I'm going to release one of those a year because I got so many other book projects that are coming out. But um, I left off, uh, I left off in the ends, and so it'll be, uh, you know, I'll, the volume two will carry on from there, and and, uh, and so on and so forth. But yeah, though, I'll be talking about a lot of the investigations I've done in Moundsville Penitentiary, and uh, and, and it's some of the most hair raising and stuff I've ever experienced, and as over my thirty years investigating. Yeah, but no, that place, uh, that that place definitely and has a history. Prisons and jails, because you know they know I'm a ex law enforcement, and they hate me. So oh, I bet I bet, I bet you've got a big giant bullseye on you. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, how about um, Willow's Week? Um, yeah. What's been happening with that? I know you have the book, right? A lot's been going on with Willow's Week. I don't know if you saw, but it was on the show Unexplained with William Shatner. Yes. On yes. His, 
on the History Channel. Um, I was on multiple episodes of that show um, mm-hmm. talking about various things. But, um, you know, it was just on a, the, the very first episode called uh, Evil Places. And, you know, they did they covered multiple locations. But I had I had the largest segment uh, on that show about Willow's Weep. And it, it really blew up. And um, basically, Willow's Weep I bought for you know, the sole purpose of studying the paranormal, uh, right. paranormal phenomenon. I've never come across another house like it. And I've been in thousands of different structures uh, over my time investigating, um, with all the deaths and nuances. I mean, it's, it's way up there probably and more bizarre than even like Amityville and stuff. I mean, it's yes. crazy and it's right. got a crossroads right in front of it. It's got all this native American ties, just numerous stuff and there's a lot more to be uncovered um i think there's some type of either native american burial ground under the house or someone was murdered and their bodies right. under the house i remember Child you mentioned that that you said there's something that is actually underneath this place well according to the prior owner a, a child's arm bone was found under the house and long story but it's in the book the book is now available on amazon just became available uh I haven't released that information yet because mm-hmm. I was doing pre sales till tomorrow night at 12, but I'll go ahead and let it be okay, known. Great. And people can buy, if you want a signed copy from me, you just uh, private message me. Uh, you can go to my website okay. and say, I would like a copy of the Willow's Wheat book and send me your address and PayPal me the money. You know, I'll tell you how to PayPal what, me what the is, money. What is your website? I'll have a link, but for the podcast listeners, what's your website? It's www.davespinksparanormalinvestigator.com. <clears throat> Okay. And then on the right when that the home page pops up, it'll say report a sighting. You mm-hmm. can just uh, email me right there. Okay. And, uh, I'll get the email and I'll tell you where to send the money. And you basically just put your, you know, return address so I can mail you a signed copy of the book. Perfect. Great. Once I receive, once I receive your PayPal payment. Sure. So, yeah. so yeah. you're not going to, yeah. In other words, the, if you want it, like you said, with, with you signing in as the author. So yeah. definitely that's yeah, a plus. I'll, I'll make it personal, you know, just tell me how you want it signed to whoever. And I'll say, you know, to Sue, for example, uh, mm-hmm. Dave Spinks, you know, whatever you, however you want it signed. So that way, if you can't catch me at an event or something, you can get a signed copy of my book like that's that. Fantastic. If you don't want a signed copy, you can go to Amazon and order one as well. And, you, you know, if you have Amazon Prime, you get free shipping. So let me ask you the, the as far as the phenomena does it extend out like into the area besides the house you know how sometimes there's like a perimeter that sometimes yeah. surrounds the house where you still yeah. get things happening some of the locals i've talked to said they've you know the whole area has activity going on and that's again uh another large native american site that dates back to the mound builders another mm-hmm. area you know so um you know we're running into this more and more with these ancient native American sites, you know? Um, so there's definitely some, uh, some well, ties uh, are going on there. You know that they have found, I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's what's there because I don't know, <clears throat> but they have done discoveries that some of these ancient mound builders, they did engage in at certain times in human sacrifice that they oh, would yeah. dig these pits, uh, and that they would perform human sacrifice. Most of them, most of the times they think that it was spurred by, uh, you know, famine, drought, yeah. you know, the uh, disease, you know, something happening. Uh, okay. But uh, you never know really what might be there. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's crazy stuff when you think about it all. I mean, it's all interrelated. And, you know, in it, I don't care what uh, religious background you have or spiritualism or whatever, but to me, when burial areas are desecrated or interrupted, that can cause paranormal activity in itself, you know, sure. um, because, you know, even even the, the more modern Native American tribes, you know, they talk about that these mound building sites were these ancient mounds and stuff. Those were taboo areas even for them because they knew there was stuff involved with that that they didn't want to mess with. Yes. And people don't realize that. Sometimes they specifically chose certain areas for burial because that's not the place for the living. In other words, we can't live there, so we might as well just use it for, in other words, either they found they, that there was a gateway, whether it was a vortex, yeah. or there was some type of elemental there or something, and they on purpose chose that 
as the place to dispose of their dead. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, yeah, it wasn't like, oh, let's just that place. No, there was usually a reason why they chose certain places. uh, Well, yeah, Um, the shaman and their medicine men are are very in tune to areas that have high energy. Mm -hmm. They would often use those places to perform ceremonies to cross over into the other world and come back and all kinds of different things. So who knows what kind of doorways were opened or never shut or whatever. Cause I, I really feel that Willow's Weep, or, uh, that house itself has a portal in it and stuff comes in and out of there at will. Right. And it's definitely in some time, somebody either conjured something very negative into that, into that uh, house. And I know there's witchcraft stuff being done in that, that whole area. And okay. As well and and even in the house as well there was some stuff done and i think that some type of evil entity actually controlled some of the people in that house to the point where they ended up killing themselves because there's so many suicides involved in that house it's it's not it's not even right the there's odds no, are just... yeah it can't be coincidence you know what i mean so sure. if you look at it from a law enforcement officer there's something that are causing these people to just kill themselves. It doesn't make it that's, you know, the, the, the odds of that are slim to none, that many people committing suicide. And I just got a recent one that's connected to the house too, that nobody knew about. So mm-hmm. I'm still gathering information on this house. And I think it goes way, way, way deeper than anyone even realizes. And you, and you know what, and th- and that's another thing, because sometimes there's stuff that happens that gets really documented, especially if there was a crime or a murder or if there was a sale or it made the newspapers. But sometimes a lot of these things, especially when we're talking a few years back, some of it doesn't get documented. And you find out just by sheer chance. In other words, you could well, do research. Weird aspect of Willow's Weed, too. Um, there's decades where there's no records of anyone specific living there because they rented the house out. Yes. And the rec- those people living there are nowhere. It's only the owner that owned it. They yes. paid the property. And that was it. Right. The deeds so, is only going to show the owner, not the renter, of course. Right. And there, you know, there's decades that I'm trying to track people down that lived in that house, you know. And the, the years that I do know the people that lived there, I mean, all these bizarre, tragic, crazy deaths happen, and and normal deaths too. So you know, it's just the the unknown in this place is unreal, and there's probably even more deaths that have occurred in there that nobody even knows about. Yes. Because they weren't on the property, you know, they were renting or whatever. So they weren't on the records. So, you know, um, and some of the older folks that were there around those years are dying off, so it's becoming harder and harder for me to find any information. You know, I'm getting yeah. second-hand information, but then I go try to track it down in the local courthouse, and I can't find anything because the house is being rented out. So... You know, the stuff I already know is just off the chain with, you know, crazy, crazy uh, stuff. Um, I, I got a uh, just, you know, I got a guy that came to me recently, wants to make a movie, Hollywood style movie based mm-hmm. loosely off the events, which is fine. It brings attention to the house and whatnot. And at the same time, we're going to film a documentary that involves me, the prior owner and many other investigators sharing what they've encountered in the house, their evidence and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk a lot about the, the, the crazy energy that's in that area, the Native American aspects, and a whole lot more that uh, goes on in that whole area over the years. So, um, you know, I think that story of this house needs to be told because it's one of those ones that you just can't overlook. You know, it's way, way up there. And as far as paranormal activity and experiences by numerous investigators over a small amount of years, since the last owner had it, um, it's, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, we've got video footage of balls rolling around in the house on their own uh-huh. with nobody in the house, door slamming. And then uh, one of the doors slammed so violently that the inner shattered. Uh, so the, uh, the former owner, Brenda, put these big, heavy rocks in front of the doors, and there's video of them shutting with those rocks, pushing yeah, the rocks. Lot. That takes so much force to be able to well, do that. Just the amount of energy that something would need to manifest and be able to move a a solid object like that is crazy. Um, I've got footage of, uh, and this was all taken off security cameras that she had in the house when nobody had been in the house for months Mm -hmm. because she renovated this house for her son to get a start in life and so much activity was going on, they couldn't even do it. Um, Power tools weren't on by themselves, not even plugged in, stuff would fly across the room, people were getting scratched, um, 
you know, she sold the house to me because she said that um, he felt the house tried to kill her and her husband on two separate occasions, and she was done with it. She just right. didn't want to even do it anymore. I mean, yeah, he had a heart attack, and every, every and he was in perfect health, never had nothing wrong with him, and that both happened when he had worked on the house, was working on the house. You know what? And, and people don't realize also when we you know we were talking about this thing with the renters where when you do have people sometimes that are involved in either some type of conjure conjuring or dark rituals, they on purpose look to try to occupy properties like this, even as a renter. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And when they're in there, it's almost like they know that this thing will telescope or magnify whatever they're doing. So they on purpose seek out properties like this. And then, of course, nobody ever is the wiser as to what they were doing or invoking right. when they were living there. Right. So, yeah. You know, the, the some of the relatives of the former owners are saying they never experienced nothing when they were there. But that doesn't mean anything because certain things activate that stuff, you know. Yes. Um, they could sit dormant for years and then all of a sudden there's a massive spike in uh, – activity for whatever reason we don't know but yes you know like i said it was it was an opportunity that presented itself and i bought the place just to study the paranormal because what better a place to do it with all the oh, the no. factual or deaths and and everything else you know so that's what uh basically that's what i'm doing with it at some point you know um i'm gonna attempt to cleanse the land and get rid of everything there and hopefully it will change everything there you know um because I think it's important that we we do those type of things. Sure. Now let me and ask you the, the well, and this is the thing people don't realize, and because I've talked about it, that sometimes you get these really badly infested houses, and even people that 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 they'll move into a new development and they're pulling their hair out trying to figure out what is going on, and it's really tied to the land. Yep. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want to say sometimes the severest hauntings are originally the land as yep. in whether there was an elemental an inhuman or like you said that was used as a burial i mean let's face it if this was a burial site and even i tell people you know a lot of times depending if it was a rural area people will use a spot as a cemetery and it's never registered on the county records in other words yep. this was the official cemetery and yep. people will use it for 20, 30 years, and then for some reason, they stop using it. And, you know, if the markers were usually made of wood, that's mm -hmm. it. They fade, and nobody is none the wiser because anybody who was around there is either dead or moved away. And everybody forgets that, yeah, there used to be a, a cemetery out there for a few hundred people. Not a lot, but a little bit, you know, out there for 30 or 40 years, and that's it. They stopped burying people because they... Well, they them with rocks or something because they yeah. didn't have a you know there was no way to carve they didn't have somebody that could carve you know and, and rock carve and all that stuff so people don't realize that even back even in the older times because everybody thinks of burials and funerals as being expensive today but even back then if you had a family or an individual that had limited amount of money it would cost you for you know just for the burial forget about an engraved uh headstone you know like uh, yeah. the ones you see in the regular cemeteries that, Ooh, costs, yeah. that costs money. Oh, a lot of money. Yep. So, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a, what I call a lot of unofficial cementaries out there or uh, boneyards that. Mm -hmm. And, you will and you know, every once in a while you'll hear a story in the newspaper how they're digging up a building or putting in a highway. And, hey, surprise, we just found a bunch of bones. And then they realize, oh, this used to be a cemetery uh, 50 years ago. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, who knows what, what's and there. A lot of times. They even knew they were cemeteries, and they would just move the headstones and oh, yeah. build right on top yeah. of them. I tell people, you know, a lot of these people that would do these, these people were were businessmen. You know, they were not sentimental. They were like, yeah, 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 yeah just move a, you know, a few the of them, and that's it. And they say they did the bodies, and they never would because it was too expensive. Yeah. And, they, you know, and that movie Poltergeist was based off actual uh, situations just like that, you know. Yes. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 uh, they. They, um, there was one, and people always think sometimes it's the poor people. There, there was that one out in San Francisco that, uh, they even now when people are doing, uh, some type of excavation or stuff on their houses, they've dug up really nice. Yeah. In other words, it was upscale, it was a regular nice cemetery, 
And they're digging up mm-hmm. these beautiful coffins of people still yep. in them because they, they never bothered to move. Like you said, they, okay, yeah, move a few and forget it. It's going to be too expensive. Nobody will know mm-hmm. when, you know, because they're thinking by the time anybody figures out, we'll be long gone. So yeah, yep. there's a lot of that that's happened. Uh, so you said you're going to be doing uh, is besides another volume of the investigations there in Virginia. Uh, do you have any other books or that you're? Oh yeah, on? Well, like I said, the Willow's Wheat book is out now. Just right. came out. Okay. Um, well, it's on, available on Amazon or from me, and any could be today, could be tomorrow. My new uh, book called Real West Virginia UFOs will be out. Oh, yeah. well. And basically, that's, uh, you know, what I did with that was I showed the whole connection between modern ufology in West Virginia, the mm-hmm. Flatwoods Monster, and just hundreds upon hundreds of accounts of people all across the state since the early, or actually since the late 1800s of UFO sightings here in the state of West Virginia. And I basically, what I did was I chronicled them year by year uh, from the 1800s all the way up to 2019. I took some of the best reports that I could find and reports that have been given to me over the years and put them all into a book. And I talk about, you know, men in black sightings, the whole Mothman wave of sightings, the Flatwoods monster sightings and everything significant that has to do with the mountain state when it comes to UFOs. Um, A lot of people don't know that right after the Flatwoods monster uh, incident in 1952, just a few short years later, um, Carl Sagan and Frank Drake, founded SETI right here in West Virginia at the Green Bank Observatory, which was a government-funded project. Oh, um, interesting. The so, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. You know, people don't really put those things together, but that's where SETI started, right here in West Virginia, uh, in, in, in Green Bank, West Virginia, at the Isn't observatory. Isn't that interesting? Because people sometimes don't realize the tie-in. And I know that a lot of people have said, you know, there's a correlation between UFO sightings and sightings of cryptids of just paranormal yeah. phenomena weird stuff like all of a sudden when everybody looks back they go man isn't that unusual we yeah. got reports of this and that at the same time mm-hmm. well yeah and that's that seems to be an ongoing theme because a lot of the recent bigfoot sightings all around the country people say you know for instance they see uh some strange lights in the sky and then in the following days, there's all these Bigfoot sightings or vice versa. They see the, there's these Bigfoot sightings and then there's strange lights seen in the same area. So there's some kind of connection going on there. You know, as an investigator, you have to take a look at those type of things outside the box, so to speak, and say, hey, is there a connection between are these things ETs, interdimensionals? What are these things? You know, um, and yes. there's so many different things on Bigfoot and other cryptids you don't know. But as far as West Virginia goes during the whole Mothman wave, there was literally hundreds upon hundreds of strange lights seen all across the state, more specifically in the Galapagos, Ohio area and Point Pleasant area. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was every night. It was so bad, in fact, that people would go out near the bunker area and there would be cars lined up up and down the highway and people would be watching these lights fly over going, what the heck is that, you know? So I, you know, I talk about a bunch of that, and I put in a bunch of the sightings that were in the local papers and everything. Mm-hmm. There was hundreds of them just in that short time frame, um, and seen by thousands of people. Oh, and some people seen them for multiple days in a row. You know, so right. There's and it's and it's like, it. yeah. And, and let me ask you: Do you think, looking back, and especially based since you've done so much research, do you think that Mothman was an observer? A war or a warning system or caused it because there's always different versions of what they think mothman represented right well i can't say either way but i know you know i know a lot of the theories on what mothman may be some say it's an e creature some say it's a, a cryptid um mm-hmm. and it even dates back to ancient cultures um there was a, a flying demon type creature uh by the ancient uh Sumerians and others that they refer to as Pazuzu, Pazuzu mm-hmm, and right. w- worship this thing. And it, it was said to be the harbinger of doom and all this stuff. Right. And this, you know, Mothman flying creature or similar type creatures have been seen all over the world, you know, before these tragic events take place, right. uh, you know, earthquakes, tsunamis, bridge collapses, whatever. So what is this saying? You know, is it some kind of guardian? Some telling, is it, 
when you see it, are we supposed to take that as an ominous warning that something bad's going to happen? Right. Um, or did it cause these things to happen? Is it a demonic type creature? Yes. Now, on the show In Search of Monsters, I investigated. They brought me in to investigate with this couple who was in the TNT bunkers like some 10, 10 11 years ago now. And they had this really just horrible experience where they captured this EVP, um, this growling voice and stuff. And ever since that time, something followed them home and they've been having all this. Yes, I saw that. They had, they were like, talk about normal people, like really normal, like ordinary people. And their lives went downhill quick because of that encounter. Yeah, and they brought me in on the show to go back into the same bunker with them. And I brought some gear, and we set up a table and everything. And, um, you know, I was asking various questions. And when I asked one question, uh, the woman got all crazy and started crying because – and they both looked at each other, and they reported that it was the same exact voice they had gotten 10 years earlier on a recorder that was, you know – threatening them and everything and she ran out of there you know just in hysterics crying and carrying on and you know we had numerous equipment going off during all this uh some of the lights that we had set up in there had just turned off all by themselves um and i you know there was huge emf all around her um and she had nothing on that could cause emf so uh you know it was pretty pretty spectacular event and Unfortunately, in TV, they cut out a lot of the good stuff, too. We we got a lot more than that, too. But, um, you know, and they've had health problems ever since, both of them, um, financial problems. You know, uh, they've just ever since that experience they had 10 years ago in that particular bunker, their lives have just been in shambles. Yeah, because they were like legend trippers originally. It doesn't sound like they were like they were just doing it just to. Yeah, they they, yeah, they never they wanted to go check it out and mm-hmm. they were didn't know anything about it they wanted to try to capture some evps and that's what they did they went and bought a cheap recorder and didn't even know they captured an evp until they got back to the hotel room and that's when they got it and it was you know just and then ever since then um one one day he was driving home from work and he claims that uh he saw something black in the middle of the road so he slowed down and then uh, a creature that looked like a mothman type creature just stood up spread its wings looked at him dead in the eyes for a few seconds and took off flying wow so it always you makes know, you think okay are we talking mothman or is there something other entity whatever right. inhuman human whatever that's just in other words like yeah mothman's around but in your case this is what we're talking about yeah and many people that have seen this thing you know claim it to feel ominous and whatnot and, you know so you know what is it i don't know it's just part of what we do as investigators trying to figure it out you know let me ask you because i, I i've heard that a lot of the people that were that actually observed the the Mothman that they had their encounters with Men in Black, uh, you know, yeah. that basically they were told shut up. <laughs> um, yeah. Was there a point that it stopped, that they stopped having these encounters with these Men in Black, or has it been going on sporadically even after that time? Well, I haven't heard of any modern day sightings in Point Pleasant, so to speak. But mm-hmm. if you talk to some of the locals that way back then that are still there, you know, they uh, had where, you know, they had had a sighting and they reported it to the paper or whatever. And then next thing you know, they're getting a knock on the door from these strange men in black tell them not to be talking about that stuff and in a threatening manner or something might happen to you. You know, um, you never saw that, you know, and you need to keep your mouth shut or, you know they might not find you one day stuff like that you know so what is that you know is that some kind of rogue government agency warning people because there's stuff going on or is you know many think the men in black are more like ets themselves coming to right which which side do those men in black fall on are they humans because they don't look human in many of the accounts they they have pasty skin you know uh they don't act normal they speak funny you know Mm -hmm. uh they don't seem to know what, uh, you know, how to operate it, like a door, for example, or a cell phone or, or many other things that anybody would know nowadays, you know. So um, just weird, the weird behavior patterns they have or don't, don't match up with a normal human. You know? Right, so, yeah, they're like a cutout. They're just like, okay, somebody's yeah. attempt to make them look human. And yeah, the, the, and you know, and I've always thought of that because I've been to Point Pleasant. I've been there. 
and it's a smaller community and I'm think I'm thinking this is for these people that I imagine lived out there back in those years this must have been like a what you know this wasn't because I tell everybody when this happened this was pre reality TV time this oh was, way before yeah you know, and people, you know people wouldn't just back in those days people you know you're talking in the middle of the Cold War. You know, mm-hmm. people were very patriotic. They wouldn't just come out and say, you know, very, most people were very church going. Yes. They wouldn't even come out and say they saw something like this unless they did feel, in fact, see it, something that they couldn't exactly. explain, you know? So, and yes. even then, many that saw it probably didn't even tell it because they were scared to death it was some oh, kind yeah. of demonic creature and they didn't even want to give it any kind of uh, attention, you know, because. Folks think if you talk about, you know, around here, this is the Bible Belt. So yes. folks think if you talk about that stuff, the more chance it has to come upon you, you know, so. I always have this theory of all the people that talk, you better believe there's a lot more that never say a word about it. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. And that's how it is here in West Virginia, even with, you know, other creature sightings that get reported to me. I get all kinds of accounts and they talk to me because I'm a local and mm-hmm. because, you know, and but they still will not. You know, you you know, you can't use my name or whatever. Oh, you sure. know, but I back in '58, I saw this. This I was hunting, and this happened. Right. You know, I just want a story told, but don't use my name. Right, you know, but so. but they sometimes people. I tell people, you know, sometimes people carry these stories around with them for years. They don't yeah, tell friends they, or family they, they, because they, right, they just want to share it with somebody to get it yeah, off. Yeah, like and chest. this person is like, this guy's not going to think I'm weird. It's not going to laugh at me and tell me I'm Ooh. crazy. And I got to tell somebody, uh, you know that this happened to me maybe once, maybe they had more than one sighting. Let me ask you, Dave, in that area, have they had any sightings of dogmen out there? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's reported dogmen sightings, um, all over the state. Um, some could be misidentified, I think maybe as a, a Bigfoot, you know, or mm-hmm. vice versa, uh, or even a bear, you know, depending, but, um, we do have a lot of, a lot of black bears here in West Virginia. Right. So, right. Um, and, yeah. And sometimes it makes you wonder what people see. Mm-hmm. And I know that a lot of hunters, sometimes the stories come from hunters that you think, well, this person, yeah, if they spend time hunting, they know what they're looking at. Yeah, and that's the thing. See, most people here in West Virginia are very familiar with all the game animals because most of the state is rural and mountainous. Mm-hmm. And even in the city, you know, you'll have deer walking your yard and everything else and all kinds of, uh, you know, animals. So, you know, it's just a wild, that's why they call it wild, wonderful West Virginia, because the whole state is mountains and full of woods and You know, I live on top of a mountain surrounded by millions of acres of woodland, you know, Mm -hmm. so, I mean, we have it all. I see bear out here in my yard. I see deer and every creature you can think of, foxes, you name it, hawks, owls. I mean, right. everything known is out here. So, yeah, um, that's my point that a lot of people, the first thing they think of when they hear these sightings, especially, you know, whether it's Bigfoot or Dogman, they're thinking, okay, this person is mistaking it for a bear and I think to myself, yeah, maybe uh, some people you, they could say, but when you live in an area, you're familiar, like you said, with the wildlife, whatever it is. Yeah. And most West Virginia boys are, you know, they grow up in the woods hunting and fishing. They know what every animal is. Mm-hmm. And when they tell you something that they know it wasn't this or that, you better listen because they, you know, they're telling you they experienced something they can't explain and scared the crap out of them, you know. Right. Um, so you got to take it to heart. On, on all these things because you know yeah and, and i've got i've got accounts from state troopers doctors lawyers teachers you name it i've got it on all kinds of strange creatures of the woods of west virginia so yeah and sometimes like i said you know there's a, 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 yeah yeah you do have people that do go out there looking for their encounter but a lot of times a lot of these sightings happen when people are not looking to have an encounter either right, like you said they camping or they're going down the road yeah. Yeah. And they have a hard time wrapping their head around it. I know that yeah. it's yeah. like, because people don't realize it. I tell everybody, you know, if whenever you have that one, this, this does like a paradigm shift for you because all of a sudden you think, okay, if, if, you know, like in, inside my head, if I go down that road and say, this is what I saw, then what else is out there? Right. That I think doesn't exist or you only see it on a on a movie. God, that mm-hmm. a lot of people that scares them very badly. Well, that's you know, I often talk about that on radio shows and whatnot. You know, people are absolutely terrified of the unknown. If mm-hmm. they can't explain it or recreate it scientifically, they don't want nothing to do with it because it literally scare, scares the hell out of them. 
and and that's understandable. Well, it opens you know, the, the un- door for so many other things yeah. to come through. That's yeah, the thing. because most people are set in their belief system, yes. and if there's something that they can't explain that's out of their realm, it, it's terrifying, and that's totally understandable. I think that's why a lot of aspects go with the UFO thing because people, you know, if you're a Christian and you believe, you know, in God and everything, that doesn't mm-hmm. quite fit into, you know, most people believe that. You know, we're the only intelligent species right. in the universe, which I, you know, as a as someone with common sense, you have to stand up and say, wait a minute, because they're finding NASA's finding new planets in the Goldilocks zone daily now. I yes. mean, with these new high tech telescopes they got out in space. Right. I mean, they saw a planet the other day. I think they said it was the size of Jupiter that is in uh, very near to us. That's in the Goldilocks zone, and it's got it looks just like Earth, but it's almost the size of Jupiter. Right. So just imagine, you know, um, right. you know, and if, if if these if these planets are billions of years older than ours, you know, what's to say there's another another intelligent species out there that may have the technology to travel planet to planet? We don't know. I mean, right? You and, and, a- and when you think of all, you know, when they look at these planets as being habitable, they're looking at it as inhabitable for carbon based forms like us life forms but you could have something that is life but developed there that's not carbon based and that doesn't mean just because you know we all we're you know we can only go as far as what we know of as far as our knowledge and then of course you know if you're talking you know of course you know they tell people you know travel in light years you would take somebody years but what if you're talking inter or intra-dimensional travel uh or even time travel time travel of course and, and what's to say that these cre- these people were once like us, similarly in bodies that die, but they figured out the way to transfer consciousness into a robot of some sort, and they, you know, have the capability of of uh, going in some kind of ship that can travel for you know these these life forms are with consciousness that can travel for millions of years. Who knows? Right, right. That that yeah. It's not a question of okay, the body's going to die. And I mean, I've heard the theory also. So I've heard of people that think that some of the grays that they're biomechanical that they're really robotic uh yeah. i heard of that theory so which goes hand in hand with what you're talking about maybe they have developed some type of very very advanced robotics as in your awareness your self-awareness your intelligence your memories it doesn't matter what happens to the i guess if you want to call it the material it has in the flesh if you want to call it that because again we're we're going out into flesh as we understand it to be that that's a whole different yeah if you're just closed-minded i mean you know there's got to be you know there's a legitimately there you know the numbers are even greater than the frank drake equation now as far as habitable planets they said you know they said it's as many as uh, a grain of sand on a beach you know um there's that many out there uh because they figured out formulas that are showing that you know it based on the known universe that there's as many habitable plan- planets as there are grains of sand on a beach any given beach so that's a that's phenomenal if you think about it right and and which leads to the thing you know because i know that there's the theory that you know that they've We've been having visits from extraterrestrials for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, some people will go from either tweaking our genetics to uh, actual visitation. Others just see them as observers. And then, of course, we can get into there's more than one with different intentions. As a matter of fact, I was just reading an article that came out that uh, I want to say it's up in Oregon. They had this uh, they've had another slew of cattle mutilations. Mm -hmm. Um, where the, again, and I saw the picture and I was like, what the carcass is complete. I mean, but the body of the cattle, if there was, matter of fact, there were bulls. It's like, if you took, you know, of course, no blood, all the organs are removed. In other words, this is not the way predators eat. It's almost like if you took something and you deflated it. Yep. And the head is there because it still was freshly dis- discovered. It's not like it's skeletal. And, of course, the hide is rare. It lies on the ground, but there's nothing mm-hmm. inside of it. And you're like, yep. how did they do this? This is not – predators don't do that. No. Um, and this, and this the, government, the government wouldn't do that either or could, probably doesn't even have the capability to do that. But if they wanted to 
dissect animals, they would they wouldn't go on some rancher's field and do it. They would just buy a bunch of cattle up and take them to wherever they're going to do it and do it. You know, they wouldn't leave them out in the middle of the field. <laughs> Well, you know. and the thing is, and again, yeah, I mean, yeah, like let's let's rustle these cattle and you know whatever, and yep. and, and of course we could go around there. Many, round you know, line. many of those things. Many of those things. It was they they say they find the carcasses, and it was like as if they were dropped from the air. Yes, There's I've no heard foot of that. tracks around. Yes. So. Yes, uh, it's it's very interesting, and I could, I mean I myself have thought okay. Uh, let's go with the ET version. I mean, how many cattle are you going to take and why? Why cattle? I mean, like, you know, at some point you're thinking, okay, biology study, but I mean, how many times do you need to look at the cattle? It's really weird if you want to, because of course we as humans are always looking for the why. Why are they doing this? Uh, some kind of food out. I don't know. Wouldn't that be? <laughs> They're not vegans. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, anything's possible at this of point. Of course, of course, yes. And I mean, like, there's a, a lot of theories behind it's like that. Missing people that a lot of them are alien abductees and they're being used for some kind of food source or experiments. You know, nobody ever finds them or hears from them again. Well, you know, then we go into that territory, and I'm sure you've heard of all these people that have gone missing in the national parks. I mean, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. when, you know, when you take out the ones that, you know, that there's possible suicides, you know, or, you know, they've been taken by animal, you know, when you put those out of the mix, that's, there's still a very high amount of people that just basically disappear, uh, vanish, yep. vanish, uh, yep. that, that, that's also that, that, I mean, that's a whole nother rabbit hole that you, people can go down as you far watch, as, um, what's you watch, uh, David Paul. New yes. movies on uh, Amazon are really good. They're yes. really good. They talk about some significant cases in that, that you know, just that will blow your mind. And, yes. Uh, he's done a great job of researching all that no, stuff. No, he and, has done, he's crunched the numbers. He's That's the hard work, I tell mm -hmm. everybody. People don't realize how much hard work is involved in that. And mm -hmm. one of the things that also to me is, I don't want to say disturbing, but in a way, yes, is why has he had such a hard time getting the numbers from the government as to missing people. Okay. I, well, there's a bunch of reasons for that. Number one, we don't know, you know, there was a, there's a whole uh, conspiracy theory, if you will, uh, about Truman making a deal with uh, aliens way mm -hmm. back when and exchanging human bodies for uh, alien tech, you know, right. and, uh, that's one. And then another one is, you know, the government doesn't want to come out and say, hey, we know there's ETs here and they're taking our people and there's not a damn thing we can do about it. And which I hate you know, to say, it, but that's that's black. that's almost like more likely than anything, because I tell everybody, yeah, what, what does the government going to say when they say we are at their mercy when it comes to stuff like that? Yeah. And who knows? Maybe they told us, you know, if you say anything, we'll just obliterate the whole earth. I mean, whatever. who knows? Yeah. I mean, or, you know, we're going to, we're know, just going to, you know, we thing that handle it. Um, a lot of the experts say, well, if the government comes out and says that, we, you know, we've been, bit, the earth's been being visited for millions of years by ETs and we're some kind of weird DNA project or whatever, it would wow. flip, people would flip out and the world would go into chaos, which is a definite possibility. But, um, well, yeah, I know. mean, let's, you know, it, it is a, let's, let's say, Let's say, like you said, maybe the extraterrestrials came and they, like you said, they made a deal with, let's say, we're going to say U.S. government, but, it, but but from what I understand, this has happened worldwide. And they'll say, okay, you know what? We're not, we're going to let you keep control and we're not going to come out and just steal people everywhere. We'll do it in such a way that it'll be kind of a mystery so that you can pretend that, you know, in other words, keep you control because so that you won't have anarchy. People running around going, ah, yeah. So it's almost yeah. like a a, a, <clears throat> a deal. It's a means of control. Well, yeah. it's a means of controlling the masses too. So. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of stuff there that, like I said, he's done so much crunching and and when I you know I used to be an investigator for the state and I know usually um, I, I understand. Believe me, how easily people can go missing. People don't realize oh, too, too, too oh, many CSI uh, programs. People think 
that it's uh, so many murders or disappearances are easily solvable and they'd be surprised how many people go missing. And oh, yeah. they never find them. They find people that went off the roadway and they've been in a lake for 25 years and they oh, finally yes. find them on accident. Yes. You know, yes. Um, the I used whole, to work with a girl that, that happened to her. That her brother, yeah. she had a young brother that disappeared one day like 20 years before. And they were dragging a canal out here because, you know, down in South Florida, we have a lot of those canals that they use for drainage because we were right on top of the Everglades. And they found yeah. him like 20 years later. They found his vehicle with him inside of it or what was yeah. left of him. But, yeah. 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 I mean, it happens all the time. They find the same with here. You know, we're in dense woods and people go off. The, you know, they have a heart attack or whatever mm -hmm. and they go off into the woods and they've never found, you know, find them a couple of years later. Oh, there's a car down over this steep bank. Look at that. Yes. They go down, check, sure enough, a dead person in there. Let me tell you something. I had been missing five years. Yeah. I mean, like I said, South Florida, we don't worry about that because we're flat down here as far as, uh, you know, highways. But, you know, on the other side of that is we've got the canals. Yeah, there's a school. lot of them out here. Yeah, I went to school at FIU, so. Oh, okay. I know so all you're about familiar that. with it. And some of these canals yeah. can be really deep. People don't realize some of them are these rock quarries that they've made along the highways. Some of them can be really, mm -hmm. really deep. But uh, yeah, the the I mean, there's a, a but I mean people, but yeah, people don't realize that even now they find sometimes skeletal remains, especially skeletal, which means of course. We don't have fingerprints and, you know, sometimes DNA evidence. First, first of all, it takes so much time and effort to actually pull DNA. And luckily now medical examiners, you know, with these John or Jane Doe's, they, you know, they leave them there for a while and they try to scrape some DNA evidence in case down the road they can connect it somehow to the identity. But they find a lot of people remains that they have no idea who this person is. None. Yep. And, uh, and the ones that were the ones where, you know, people are out in the woods with their family and they're right there and they turn around and next thing you know, they're gone. Yes, nothing, yes. Then, nothing there. We had something Those like that happen true. like in 2012, 2000, uh, Everglades National Park. We had that. An older man, he was originally from Oregon. And he was traveling with his family in one of those uh, big uh, RV camper deals. And they had gotten yeah. down into the Keys, coming back out. They went into Everglades National Park. They parked. They got in there like in the afternoon. And I've been there. And at the time he was there, they especially in the wintertime, there's a lot more, you know, tourists. And, you know, everybody went to do something real quick. And all of a sudden, he's gone. They couldn't find him. Yeah. And, and by the way, he wasn't, you know, no problems with as far as dementia or Alzheimer's or bad health. Nothing. And this man... Uh, disappeared they've never found him again he didn't have any problems uh up in where he lived originally he was an outdoorsman uh yeah. it was the weirdest weirdest thing and again so i mean my view is one of three things you know uh either he was either a big ass gator got him mm -hmm. uh, one of those giant snakes got him or he was beam me up scotty well you know <laughs> let me tell you something i've so, been out there i've been out there several times <clears throat> especially where they have the Parts where people he was camp. kidnapped Throw that in. Ooh. and uh even if the water because out there even if you found the water like right off right there first of all there was a lot of people running around you know somebody's gonna hear something uh the water is not Flat. really that that deep because as a matter of fact out there there's an area called Ten Thousand islands which is the area the water is really shallow before you really get into deep water and i mean you look at the circumstances and it's just so weird but it's just exactly like what they talk about these people like you said Everybody looks away for a second or does something, comes back, and we're so-and-so. And that's the last of, that they know about this person. So it's crazy, yeah. But anyway, Dave, I want to thank you so much for spending this time today. Uh, it's been fantastic, and I know you're a busy guy, and you've got so many things coming up. By the way, are you doing anything for Halloween? Are you going, attending any event or anything like that? Well, I was going to have an event at the Willow's Weep House, but mm -hmm. uh, I think some circumstances may have changed. Uh, something dropped into my lap, and I may be doing a, uh, a very, very old and well-known plantation oh. in South Carolina. Because uh, I just don't have enough people that want to come to the Weep event right now. So, okay. Um, 
and this is one of these type of situations that came up that, uh, Hey, you know, you gotta take advantage of it when it comes to you like that. Um, you know, I'll probably be doing some live stuff on Halloween. Just don't know where exactly yet. So, um, you know, do some live stuff on my YouTube channel and whatnot. Okay. And, um, and uh, I got several events coming up. Um, I'm also teaching um, paranormal, uh, basic paranormal classes for folks up at the. I'll start doing that this coming weekend up at uh, a place in Pennsylvania really? called the Synergy Synergy Soul Center. Okay. Um, it's going to be a lot of. It's basic. It's basically for people who don't know any. For you know, don't know what any of the equipment's for, how it's used, stuff okay. like that. Just basic stuff. Um, you know, to give people that want to be educated a little bit and, and give them some <laughs> techniques and some investigating and stuff like that. Um, so, I'll, you know, you can find all that information on my website um, and upcoming events I'll be appearing at and speaking at. Okay. Um, i got several more this, this month and ne- a few next month and even a few in December. So Okay, so the um, best bet is just to check out your website to... Yeah, yep. You'll post just that information website. on there. Yep. Yeah, wow. a lot of cool stuff coming. Like I said, two books coming out. Yeah. Actually, three. Oh, I forgot to mention, I got a third book coming out any day now, too, that it's a collaboration with my good friends uh, David Weatherly and Ross mm-hmm. Allison on all about cases we've worked on separately oh, here in wow. West Virginia. It's called uh, Haunted West Virginia Files, so it's pretty. It's going to be a great book, and that's coming out any day now, too. So oh, Congratulations. To yeah, you're definitely a busy guy, I'm telling you. Writing is hard work. <laughs> believe me i know well okay. it's just basically all this stuff built up for 30 years so i you know yeah. i just pull it out of my case files and and slap it in a book <laughs> yeah but still it, so. it, it, it it takes up your time it's and and uh and i know what you mean that all of a sudden especially if sometimes you have a deadline or you're trying to get something done it's like okay i can only spread myself so thin so what's my priority here and it's like everything is a priority that kind of deal yeah it's crazy this year with all i mean i've done uh, i did seven different tv shows this year um, and I've already filmed some stuff for 2020, yeah. uh, on other shows. So, you know, it's just been a wide open, busy year. Uh, and I hadn't had, I, you know, this is the first time in a long time I haven't met my, you know, done even close to my normal amount of investigations that I do every year yes. because of all this other stuff I wanted to get out there with the books and everything. And then the yeah. TV stuff just came out of nowhere. So, yes, I totally understand. Again, I want to wish you the best of luck. Uh, 2019 and 2020. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Take care. All right. You too. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. I'm telling you. We talked briefly uh, before we started to roll. <clears throat> and he is. He's a super busy guy. I mean, for real busy. Because sometimes you talk to people so so busy and it's like not not, not really no, and you have to understand that in the middle of this, there's such a thing as called living, <laughs> like normal stuff, which is, uh, you know, um, you know, saying, hey, I, uh, I got to take care, you know, of, I got to do groceries, I might need to go to the doctor, I have an appointment, I got to take stuff to the cleaners, I've got to, my family, people, you know, that stuff is still there in the background going on when you're being pulled in a hundred different ways. So my point being, I'm very lucky that I got Dave to talk about it and he's got a lot of things. So again, I'm going to have a link to his website, but if you want to get an updated version of maybe what events or what books he's got coming out, your best bet is to go to the website. And uh, because it sounds like he's got a lot of things. I wasn't even, I would, I didn't know he was doing the classes and um, again, this comes back to, you know, when somebody's been investigating for so long, okay, you develop this backlog of cases, okay? Because like he said, you know, I've been doing it since the 1990s. He's been doing it for 20 years. This is, you know, you, um, when you either collect or, or participate in investigations pre-reality TV time, you know, in other words, this was, you know, you had cases that, never thought really well if even making a book you know you just keep the information because sometimes uses as reference 
Sometimes you even have tie-ins. Sometimes you even have follow-up. Sometimes years later, you'd be surprised. Or things, um, cases that either are very similar or really close by. You know, so that's when you go back into your whatever information you kept. And I'm telling you, uh, no matter how good you think your memory is, nothing is quite the same as when you document what you've come across. Uh, whether pictures, I even have some that, I even have just the negatives. Uh, remember, this was pre-digital, <laughs> digital photography. Um, a lot of stuff that, uh, and my experience has been sometimes things that you think will, you know, they'll never come back upon that, 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 that they don't matter. You just have it there because you've kept records. They, something pops up and you'll think, wait a minute. I had a case just like that. Or, hey, that's right down the block. Yep. Yeah. Wait a minute. Is that right down the block? Let me let me check that out. Or something very similar. Even names. Sometimes you will have names that come back up. I have had cases of people um, recontacting me 10 years later. And usually it happens because they're now in a new place and something's happening and they reach out because in surprise believe it or not to find that i'm still involved in the paranormal and they'll start off do you remember me uh and nine times out of ten i do remember who they are or i'll say okay where, where was it and then they and they're surprised when i say oh yeah and they've had they're having something happen and Sometimes, I hate to say, these are the cases that fall into, it's not the place, it's you or the family or a combination. You know, sometimes, yeah, you did have something there that you had spiritual turbulence surrounding you or your family unit. And then when you go into a place or you moved into a place that either had something already active or even dormant, which is what he was talking about, how you'll talk to prior uh, renters or people that live there and they'll say, nothing ever happened with us or what? And it's because it's dormant. doesn't mean it's there. It's just, it's really weird. Uh, or some people are just smart enough that if they experience minor stuff, instead of feeding it, they ignore it. And it kind of like dies down, uh, especially if it's something residual or if it's not, not really malevolent, uh, let's say it's that typical, I built this house where I lived this house for 40 years and it's my house and you can't leave them alone. And then they go off to the attic or to the basement. They just hang out there and you leave them alone and they leave you alone and they kind of like go to sleep because, well, oh, you haven't tried to get rid of me. Eh, okay. That's it. And that's why you'll have people staying at certain places and they'll say, I'm Oh, nothing happened with me. I don't know what, what you're talking about. And it's been there all along. So it, it's that's the time when all these keeping all these records is so important. Uh, even sometimes on cases that you go to that you're kind of undecided. Is there something here? Isn't there something here? Um, you know, you've got people that you they're credible in other words they're credible what they're telling you and you go there maybe more than once but you just don't get any evidence that's really uh that you couldn't de i don't want to say debunk but that are fall into that gray area where it's it is but not really and you kind of like leave it at that and then uh something happens months years later sometimes People will recontact you or I have had also cases where people have moved into the same house and somehow or other somebody told them, hey, you know that there was a group out here that a few years back were investigating because now they're experiencing things. And contrary to what people think, sometimes when people move into a house, everything is really quiet. I've, I've, had, I've had people move in and it's months or sometimes even a couple of years. 
that they're moving and nothing happens and then stuff starts happening and then they're like huh and then they kind of like you know either neighbor somebody t tips them off and say you know what the people that used to live there something was going on because they had a paranormal group or they had somebody come out here and do this or that for them you know they had a blessing and uh, or basically sometimes depending on the relationship you have with your neighbors sometimes neighbors will talk to neighbors and you know say man i've got all this weird stuff in my house how about you and then eventually years pass they move away but that neighbor next door is still there so they're like the repository of the information which is what me and dave were talking about sometimes a lot of things happen in a house that you're not going to find in county records you're not going to find it in the newspapers uh, which, by the way, is sometimes even, you know, uh, historians, that's what they go through. It's it's just basically word of mouth, speaking to the right person that'll tell you a story. And they'll say, well, yeah, and, oh, and by the way, and you know that this happened and that happened. What? Oh, yeah. And, you know, that uh, that person that supposedly committed suicide, you know, it was written up in the newspapers as a suicide. Well, you know what? The real skinny on that is, well, this is, we think that that person was killed by their husband, wife, neighbor, uh, business partner, but you know what? They just powers that. And they, and you would think, well, you know, why doesn't anybody speak up? Let's face it. If you live, especially if the community you live in, whether it's a bigger city or a community or a smaller town, and you know or suspect one of the two you don't want to get involved in this as much as people for, for a variety of reasons number one you might think you know what i'm going to complicate my life put my life in jeopardy or god knows my family for what you know this is done deal especially if the person that they think did it uh has got some power or that they just don't want to open that in other words that person's dead and i'm not about to be the one to blow the whistle uh especially if it was investigated by the police and it was determined to be a suicide for example or they only have suspicions or gossip hearsay so again you know all you know a lot of times things will take place where the documentation doesn't really reflect accurately what took place which sometimes leads right back to uh this is the point of origin for a haunting or somebody that died under let's say from an illness you know and, and, and i'm sure all of you have heard of these people that uh they were being poisoned by a parent a child a spouse very slowly and they die apparently from some type of lingering disease or illness and then it turns out if ever you know they were being poisoned do you think that there was a lot of people that died that nobody ever did an autopsy sure that happened no no this person was being methodically done away with and uh again because we go into this um what do you call it this csi effect kind of deal that we kind of think that all the clues are going to be there and all the scientific and all of this and i wasn't kidding you know dna you know um extracting dna uh, testing dna all of that is very time consuming and expensive by the way uh that's why sometimes these databases that they'll have of um of what they'll let's say they'll have a crime scene from the 1980s and now 25 30 years later if 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 they did collect any type of dna evidence either not only of the victim but if whoever committed the crime left any type of dna evidence that now they're linking that crime sometimes either with a person that, that's already in jail or sometimes has even died you know like in jail like they were jailed maybe for some other crime but they're able to um link that killer we whatever you want to call that 
with that crime. And what's really weird is that, you know, because, you know, of course, you always think of, you know, the crime is committed by somebody that, you know, knows each other. But you'll have sometimes serial killers or what they call spree killers or people that they kill people that they don't even know their names. You know, uh, where if, if, if at any point they're ever caught uh, and they either because they decide to or they can't get any worse because maybe they've been sentenced or they make a deal, you know, life imprisonment versus uh, death penalty, depending on what, you know, what jurisdiction they're out of. And a lot of times they can only tell law enforcement, well, you know what, I killed this person out in this area 20 years ago. Do you have a name? Nah, I picked her up on the side of the road. Or I picked her up at a bar. I think her name was, I think it was Mary. They themselves don't know the name or anything about this victim. And then they'll say, well, where did you dump the body? Um, I threw it out of my car in a ravine. Or I can't remember. You know, because of course what the police is trying to do is they're trying to, you know, they've got all these missing people or uh, skeletal remains that have been found and they're trying to link them up. But sometimes they have... They, they can't make the connection because even the killer themselves really don't know who that person was. It was like a stranger on stranger, which, of course, are the most difficult cases to solve. OK, so, I mean, that's what I'm saying that, you know, that CSI stuff, that is not always the way crimes are solved. And like I said, there's a lot of murders and disappearances that are never solved or identified or even made aware of. And then we just come right back to this is the genesis of a lot of hauntings because sometimes if we're not talking the the person that committed the crime the perpetrator we're talking these victims where they're tied to the earth plane because they were killed nobody knows what happened to them who did it to them you know maybe they might be tied thinking you know my family never knew what happened to me or who did it to me? Uh, I mean, there's a variety of reasons, but it's it's, it's a very interesting theory <clears throat> as far as um, crime and the psychopathology of. Because believe me, <clears throat> you know, you, we also see all these uh, serial killers. We'll go with a serial killer thing because that's attracts so much attention. You know, and they've done all these profiles of why they do it and how they do it and why they get caught and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, or, you know, you hear about these, uh, these, you know, uh, killers or serial killers that they send notes to the police or to newspapers and, you know, everybody says, oh, they want to get caught. For every one of those, I'm telling you, there's a lot more out there that shut up. They have no desire to get caught. Like, you know, that thing about, oh, they want to get caught. They are not, they're not stupid enough to send a note to anybody. You know, that bragging thing, I'm so smart, I can outsmart the police. Believe me, there's a lot of them out there that whether they think it or not, it's like they're not out to prove anything. Only thing they want is to keep killing people, whatever it is that they do, without being stopped. Okay. And some of these killers are very intelligent and others are not. And yes, some of them are narcissistic, which means the, the, those are the ones that want to engage in the recognition of I'm so, you know, you'll never catch me kind of deal. And then there's others that their prime directive, if you want to look at it, is I want to be able to continue to kill people or even if let's say they, as they get older you know they're like slowing down they just they, they have no plans to spend the rest of their lives in a jail cell they don't so they're very careful about that and they take these things to the grave and you know if they have families either the family doesn't know about it you know like you've seen some of these killers that have uh, double lives and uh, they they don't say anything. 
you know, the best kept secret is that you're the only one that knows. They know that and they implement it. And like I said, there's there's a gazillion undiscovered remains or, you know, or remains that have yet to be identified that are the products of, which by the way, are the scariest killers, by the way, out there. Those ones that they have no need for recognition, no desire, and are very careful, especially every time they commit a crime. And if you think that you know, you only that they don't watch all these this information about the specifics of uh, how they can recover evidence from crimes. Yeah, they look at that too. But anyway, guys, thank you again for being part of my audience. It's wonderful that you guys come back every week and spend this time with me. I've got a lot of fantastic guests coming on, so please make sure uh, to make sure that you subscribe. Your notification bell is on, whether it's on YouTube or any of the other uh, podcast platforms that I release the show on so that way you can make sure that you uh, get notified of when there's a new show coming on. Take care.